to pass a, a bill like SB 26 that would draw from permanent fund earnings, uh, do you think it's necessary to also pass a constitutional amendment to protect the PFD for, for all of you? Well, very interesting question. Um, uh, you know, the mantra here lately um, has been first things first, let's get the operating budget over the Senate, which we've achieved. Um, and the next uh, step, of course, would be to address the issue of having um, some sort of structure around the, the annual drawdown from the permanent fund. And whether that's, um, uh, you know, statutory percentage of market value approach or whether that's something you actually enshrine in the Constitution. Um, I expect those discussions to, uh, you know, be also a part of, uh, of the session ending discussions. Um, and like uh, Becky and I almost referred to as Representative Bohr, but it's too <laughs> early in the morning for a demotion. Uh, but as, as Becky uh, from the AP mentioned a moment ago, you know, speaking of the must haves that, uh, that are out there to get us out of uh, Juno. I think there, there will be a lot of focus on some kind of uh, a PUMV uh, plan and how that takes shape. Uh, I think those discussions will begin in earnest going forward. Um, good morning, Nat Hurst with the uh, Anchorage Daily News. Um, I, I guess I just wanted to sort of follow on to that question. Um, do you got, does your caucus um, feel that it is necessary to set some kind of Per, permanent or as permanent as a statute is um, permanent structure in law for how the permanent fund uh, you know should be managed beyond just doing it in the budget or is that something that as long as you have a some kind of a structure in the budget that if there's not support for 26 this year you guys could leave that to a future legislature well when you look at the fact that uh, statutory guidelines can be you know, basically ignored by the legislature. And given the fact that the House Majority Coalition's attempt to put a full fiscal plan together basically um, fell on deaf ears last session and, and this session, um, you know, you, you really have to think about the pressure that's being put on the, the permanent fund dividend itself and certainly on drawing down the money needed for essential services. And I, I can tell you in our coalition, um, there's... Uh, a number of folks uh, who strongly believe that we need to enshrine the dividend in the Constitution and also have uh, that drawdown from the fund itself be, um, uh, you know, in the Constitution so that we can protect the fund, protect the dividend, and also, um, you know, spur the legislature into action in terms of putting together a reasonable, uh, comprehensive fiscal plan that allows those who can pay uh, a little bit more, a very modest amount, pay their share, but those that can't afford to pay um, you know, not have to pay so much. So that's kind of a long way of saying that um, there's interest in it and uh, whether or not it takes shape between now and uh, uh, when we get out, uh, again, we'll know soon. But so fair to say that um, it, it doesn't sound like that is like a must have or, de or a demand or a requirement for your caucus to be able to like leave here um, would be to have, at this point, like that's not what it sounds like. It, and uh, I just uh, add that, you know, we passed SB 26, but we passed it as part of a plan. And it requires new revenues uh, going forward to balance that. And so we start solving our deficit problem. So um, we passed House Bill 111, which was oil and gas taxes and oil and gas um, tax credits last year over to the Senate. Uh, they were willing to take out part of that and go halfway and, and resolve the credit program, which we have done. Um, but the oil tax reform that we passed to them is not uh, currently on the table. So we in House Finance are spooling up the uh, bill, which was passed last year, the tax portion of that, so that there'll be something that is there so that wouldn't make it so that we would have some new revenues as well as the um, uh, POMV kind of uh, institution uh, in SB 26. So we'll have some consideration. The, the Senate will have something to look at. Uh, they've already had it because we passed House Bill 111 to them and they have the, all of those elements. Uh, and so 
So we're just separating those from the tax credits and going to reintroduce that so that the Senate can reconsider that uh, if they want um, SB 26, um, you know, as a permanent fund only solution. We're not looking at permanent fund only solution, but if we combine that with um, some oil tax reform, then I think that we can probably be much closer to uh, getting to the table. I would just add <clears throat> and say under the current circumstances um, in terms of must-haves, I, I personally don't see um, SB 26 or constitutionalizing as either of those being must-haves right now for us to leave here. So under the current circumstances without a full fiscal plan and so forth. Additional questions, James? Well, can I, can I just quickly follow up? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, is, do you think that's a fair... To, to, do you think it's a fair thing to leave Alaskans with after this session to not, you know, basically to do a one-time, you know, albeit a probably sustainable draw on the permanent fund, but basically leaving the problem of sort of a, a longer-term solution to the next legislature sometime in the future and subjecting all of us to sort of this drawn-out fighting again and again? Well, yeah, is it a question of fairness? And I, I would add to your question, uh, a question our coalition has been asking all along, is it a, a, a question of fairness not to have a comprehensive fiscal plan in place that uh, allows uh, some 20% of non-residents to come in and use their services annually and hardly pay a dime for it and uh, requires, uh, under the current structure, of just using the earnings for the permanent fund, low-income people to essentially give up half of their dividend as well as people who are well off all in the quest to pay for essential services uh, when in all the other 49 states there is uh, clearly a situation where you got a diversified revenue stream, right? So the issue of fairness, I think um, it's in the eye of the beholder, whoever you talk to here in the legislature and certainly whoever you talk to uh, through around the state. So, um, you know, I, I guess I'd come back with that response, uh, Nat. And, and I'd just like to add to the to that there's two different perspectives. One is we should concentrate on telling future legislatures what to do, and ours in the House has been focusing on actually doing it in the current legislature. So um, we had the same thing with the early funding of education. We passed an early funding of education bill out of here. You know, the Senate has a bill to um, uh, do it for future legislatures um, and, and say what should be done. Uh, you know, early funding of education has not had a priority in the, um, in the Senate. Uh, so I, I think actually accomplishing the job at the time uh, when you have, have to take the tough votes uh, to do it yourself is much more important than uh, just looking at telling future legislatures what they should do. I had a question about inflation proofing for the permanent fund in the budget this year. The governor had proposed making the back inflation proofing payments from the earnings reserve to the constitutionally protected section of the permanent fund. Um, you guys took that out. There's just inflation proofing for this year. Um, you've talked about the sustainability of the fund, and I wanted to ask you about that, uh, removing the inflation proofing. Why do that if you're interested in sustainability? Sure. Uh, thank you. And, and $942 million is not a sneeze. Um, that's the inflation proofing for FY19. Uh, we really need to have some kind of comprehensive uh, revenue sources that will um, aid us in the future before we go back, I think, and do, you know, this is the first time in three years that inflation proofing has taken place. Uh, so I think that's very important. But going back and saying we're going to inflation-proof for um, the 2016 and 2017 years uh, was not something that we felt we could do unless we're, because you're trying to balance your revenues and your expenditures, and without any source of revenue, there's been absolutely no increase in any kind of, or diversification of our revenues in the state. And so without doing that, it's very difficult to say you're going to um, go back and do what uh, didn't happen in the past. Is it just because you know you need the earnings reserve and so you want to have as much money in the earnings reserve as possible? Um, that's, that's correct. I mean, you, you need a revenue source. You need to more closely balance your revenues and your expenditures before you start reducing 
uh, the money that could be available in an emergency to uh, the legislature. Not a budget question. Rich Mauer, Charlton News. Um, I know, Mr. Speaker, you've said that this is not a binding caucus. <clears throat> it's one thing to sort of be non-binding on members. It's another to be non-binding on leaders. Is, um, is Representative Ledoux in any, does she still chair of rules? Is she still in the leadership? Well, you know, I'll be very frank. Um, I was disappointed by her vote uh, uh, against uh, the budget uh, yesterday. But in her defense, she's been very clear and open about her intentions uh, that, that, that did not catch us by surprise. Um, and uh, so uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, looking forward, uh, are working hard to keep our caucus together. I think we've, we've been a real strong unit. She's a part of our caucus, and I expect her to, to stay part of the team going forward. Becky Bohr with AP for Representative Seaton. Um, can you just remind us when, when you're talking about the oil tax pieces from HB 11, what specifically you intend to revive? And if you're, you're worried about, if you have any reservations, I guess, about advancing this, given that HB 111 talked about a working group and then moving forward with oil tax reform. The um, HB 111 uh, was a tax and credit solution. Um, the Senate was only willing at that time to take up the credit solution. Uh, as part of that, uh, they added in a working group. However, we had already passed over a solution, and that was going back to the 25% tax rate that uh, the Governor Parnell had originally introduced in, in SB 21 and getting rid of these uh, per barrel credits that escalate as you go and lower in price, it becomes this Pac-Man just eating up all of the revenue from the state. And so um, we are in a time right now where the uh, major oil companies, especially as exemplified by ConocoPhillips' own charts, are earning more percentage of the North Slope oil than ever in history. They are now at $65 a barrel their share is 48%. Every time that oil taxes have been considered since 2006, all the consultants said it's somewhere between 66 and 71% is the international average for our kinds of oil fields uh, that should go to the non-producer. And the last year, in 2017, uh, their producer share at $65 a barrel was 37% and now it's 48%. And that transfer of um, money to the producers is something that is eating a hole in our budget. Uh, part of that comes from the federal government, but part of it, 4% of that 11% <clears throat> change came right out of the state share. So um, we do need to address that, but we want to do it in the percent of profits range so that we're not impacting uh, any of anybody that has a very high cost field is non-profitable. So if you're paying 25% of a profits tax, uh, that is um, much better than a um, a higher gross tax, which um, impacts everybody uniformly, whether you're making money or not. One last question. <clears throat> what was the uh, issue over the uh, remaining amendments that did not get heard either Friday or yesterday? Well, those amendments um, largely dealt with uh, the permanent fund, and there was, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, there was a number of amendments that, uh, there was actually a couple that were considered during uh, uh, the, the revisiting of amendment number one. There were a number of those amendments that were majority amendments that uh, were sort of placeholder amendments, if you will. and. Uh, I think there was also an additional amendment in that group that we did consider throughout the deliberation. So, uh, you know, we felt we did our work on the permanent fund dividend. We reached a compromise. Uh, our overriding objective was to get the operating budget over to the Senate. Uh, we were successful at doing that. And I think the process uh, worked out uh, very, uh, very nicely in the end. Thank you, everyone. See you here next week. That was easy. <laughs>